To explain the title, Creating Order Out of Chaos, many people when they're learning a language, particularly in the lower levels up to, say, B2, uh, see a, a new language as, as chaos, particularly, particularly vocabulary, particularly Lexis. If we look at um, grammar, grammar has rules, but vocabulary seems to have no rules. And there seems to be a, a lot of chaos for students. It seems to be a very daunting prospect of learning a language. So the basic model for this talk, and really for my teaching and my writing uh, that I do, is this. That on the left, you can see there the real world uh, chaos. Language is chaos. If, when you're learning the language, as I just explained there. In the classroom, it seems our job, and in, the, in course books, it's our job to to do those things in the box there, the square box in the middle, to create order from that chaos, to teach, to organize language, uh, to help students record that language, and, and obviously to help students to learn the language. It seems very basic, but often it doesn't happen. So that they can go back into the, the real world, uh, the world of chaos, and also into the world of, of tests and exams, uh, such as the Cambridge First exam, or any other exam. Cool. So creating order from chaos, preparing students in those different ways in that central box. Now I'm going to start with phrasal verbs, an area of vocabulary which is very relevant to the first and obviously to other areas of English as well, and particularly in, in general English as well, but also exams, of course. Um, the first exercise here is an exercise of what not to do, what I think uh, perpetuates the chaos in the classroom. This is an exercise from a course book. Uh, from a few years ago where students match the phrasal verb on the left to the meaning on the right. The language is completely decontextualized. It's guesswork. Uh, it doesn't help at all. There's no ordering of language. There's no, no help for students at all. It doesn't help them learn. It doesn't teach uh, at all. So that's uh, an example of what not to do. In fact, here's also an example of a, uh, an exercise which is very, very common in course books. Uh, just fill the gap with the correct particle, through, away, off, out, and so on. Um, and number one, my auntie said she'd put me, well, I'll put me up for the night when I go to Oxford, but I think I'd rather stay in a hotel. The answer's up, yes, but it's, it's guesswork. If you don't know the phrasal verb, uh, how are you going to know what is the particle to put in there? Uh, fine as a testing exercise, but as a teaching exercise, it doesn't teach. Uh, it again perpetuates the chaos. Doesn't help students at all create any order from the, from that chaos that we mentioned before. And a final kind of exercise, and this is from an exercise from a course book published last year, which says phrasal verbs with put work in pairs. Think of as many phrasal verbs with put as you can. Then check your ideas in the dictionary. And I'm going to put uh, a little warning with this exercise here. Do not try this with your students. This is precisely the kind of thing which perpetuates the chaos. It's uh, think of as many phrasal verbs we put as you can. Well, students will, in pairs, probably just stick any particle they want to with that put, put up, put down, put over, put in, put out, put away, put off, put from, whatever, and then check their ideas in the dictionary. Further chaos, because in the dictionary, uh, in, in the Macmillan Advanced English Dictionary, for example, there it is there, or any other advanced dictionary or online dictionary, there are four pages, that's eight columns uh, for put, the verb put. And, for, and I've got a little crib sheet here for, for put up, the phrase of word put up, there are nine different meanings. For put down and put out, there are ten meanings each. And for put on, there are no fewer than 17 different possible meanings. So you can imagine the kind of chaos that would create in your classroom, checking your ideas in the dictionary. Okay, I've put down, I've put down, there's one again. I've put on, I've put on, okay, it's got 17 meanings. Am I going to look at all of those meanings or, or, or what? It's just chaos, complete chaos. So, uh, here's an alternative. This is my alternative, and this will uh, also form the basis of, of some of the downloadable material uh, that you'll get after the session for you to use. This is my take on phrasal verbs with put. Some of you will recognize this if you uh, use ready for first, uh, but I will be giving you more unpublished material a bit later following the same guidelines. In this kind of exercise, students have the first uh, part of the sentence here at the top, and they match it to the second part of the sentence at the bottom. And then they can look at uh, the context that's created there and, um, 
and work out the meanings of those phrasal verbs from the context. Now, uh, let's take this exercise apart. You can already see there, put on is three meanings, put up and put off. They're grouped according to uh, well, the particle there, three for on, three for up, three for off. So we're already creating a little bit of order out of that chaos. Okay, there aren't 17 meanings of put on. That would be uh, confusing for students, but there are three of the more frequent uses there. Um, these are the sentence beginnings. Let's have a look at them. And, and you can, I'm not going to ask you to put them in your chat box, but you can actually think about what the continuation, this context is so strong that you as native or near native speakers will know uh, what's going to come next more or less. And that really is what we want students to be able to do as well. So I've joined an amateur dramatic society, we're going to put on, well, it's going to be a production or a play, a show or something like that. These trousers are far too tight for me now, I must have put on. Well, there are, in fact, the intended answer for this one was put on weight. Um, but, of course, it could be I must have put on the wrong trousers or I must have put on my sister's trousers or something like this. Um, have a look at the other one, see if you can think of the uh, possible continuation. There's not just one possibility, but there's nothing on television this evening we could put on. <clears throat> I'm going to have to move out of my flat. My landlord's put up. Don't shout out the answer, Laura. You know you have to put up. Joe's coming to London tomorrow, and I've offered to put him up. Now, the continuations I've got, compare with what I have here, are these ones. A production of Hamlet, wait, the radio instead, my rent again, your hand first, and for the night. Now, you may have had something similar to that going on in your own mind. Uh, may have been slightly different, but, but the context is very, very strong. And then, of course, uh, the, the meanings there, uh, next to each one of those. Now, I'll say a little bit more about I'll explain what, what's happening here uh, as we go through. This is the exercise, as I said, that students have. They have. The, they don't have to do what you just did. They have the first part of the sentence, and they have the second part of the sentence, and they match them up. They use that context to help them match. We, we've talked about how much a dramatic society in number one. We know we're going to get something related to theatre, and we have uh, a production of Hamlet in June for, for option G. So that context helps them match it up. And the same with the others as well. And then they have the meanings, and I've grouped these according to the, the particles. So which ones, uh, students have to match these to the uh, correct sentence or the correct phrasal verbs. Increase, raise into the air and accommodate are all meanings for put up, three different meanings. Postpone, discourage from, distract, put off. And the last one, put on, put organize, game, make equipment, start working. And once they've matched the second part of the sentence to the first, then matched the meanings or worked out the meanings themselves from context, uh, then they can cover up. Uh, this is the important part about helping students to learn. They have a record here, a contextualized record for each phrasal verb. And they can have a, have a way of helping them to learn this, these phrasal verbs by covering up the second part of the sentence and seeing if they can remember, just as we were doing just now. And also covering up the meanings and see if they can remember the meaning of each of the phrasal verbs there as well. And then after you've done that, I'll show you more, another example of that in a minute. Uh, and then after that, then you can do something like this. Then you can do a revision exercise uh, where they're all mixed up. Uh, where we've assumed that they've already been through that exercise of order, creating the order from the chaos, and this is going back into the chaos and some kind of revision exercise like that. Perfectly acceptable, but not as a teaching exercise. Okay, chaos to order, and then back to the chaos or the test testing type of uh, exercise. Now, in the downloadable material that, that you'll get afterwards, if you want to use it, uh, here's the first thing I've got, is that there's a whole section on phrasal verbs, and I've called this one Top 30 Phrasal Verbs. Now, this comes from the fact that in the last few months, I've been preparing a class locally in a secondary school, uh, very close to my house, a state secondary school in Madrid, which also happens to be a bilingual school, bilingual in inverted commas. They, they have a lot of lessons in English. And there were some students there in, who, of age 13, 14, who already had the PET exam, uh, 
and I took, uh, helped train them towards first certificate exam. So I had a small group of students there and I only had three months to prepare them and that was just one lesson, sometimes two lessons a week. So I thought what I need to do is uh, select some phrasal words that could be useful to them in the exam based on my experience of uh, the Cambridge exam and what comes up in the different papers uh, in, in, in the first exam. So in the uh, downloadables you'll have um, top 30 phrases, here are 10, here are just 10 of them, there are three sheets like this and you'll recognize there, there's the first part of the sentence, there's the second part which they match up and then at the bottom the meanings. Um, and we, with this class I was teaching or I've been teaching until, until last week when they took the exam on the 30th of May, um, over the course of that period I introduced these phrasal verbs little by little and we did exactly what I've been talking about here working on the, the sheet here and then covering up the, the second part, covering up the meanings and seeing how many they could remember and the results were uh, gratifying and very, very good. Uh, they were, became very good at these phrasal verbs. We uh, finished off with a couple of tests, phrasal verbs in transformations, the context of transformations which I'll mention a bit later if you're not sure what transformations are. Uh, those are based on, on sort of a typical thing that Cambridge uh, give in the transformation papers, all based around phrasal verbs and then there's also in the downloadable material a phrasal verbs revision test which we did at the end to see how many, how well they could remember them, each one in context there as well. Um, so that's, that's the first section of downloadable material that you, you'll find after the session. Um, I would also at this stage like to say that that's not the only way of teaching phrasal verbs, of course it isn't, there are many other ways, uh, but I do think it's important that phrasal verbs have some kind of context. Um, and here's another, here's an example from Ready for First where phrasal verbs are presented in a story, in this case phrasal verbs with take, and rather than gap fill, students are given the phrasal verb and are asked to work out the meaning from the context that they have there. So if you just look at the first one, or I'll read it to you, Roisin always took after her dad, her mother was a calm, laid back type of person, but Roisin, like her father, was ambitious. So there's a kind of exploration of the phrasal verb after. And it's the same for all of those in there. There are eight different phrasal verbs we take. Um, they work out the meaning and then uh, talk about the meaning together and then read the story and you'll be uh, amazed at how well they can remember the story uh, if you just put the phrasal verbs onto the board uh, or in the next lesson how well they can retell the story using those phrasal verbs. So there's this phrasal verbs in, in context and another way of looking at phrasal verbs in context is to look at the listening script. Here's an example again from Ready for First. Use the context to help you guess the meanings of the phrasal verbs in bold. So the same kind of thing, uh, but this time within a, a listening script. I owned up to my dad about lying. I felt so guilty I had to tell him. Uh, and then students can work out the meaning from that. And then importantly, um, it provides a record. Record the phrasal verbs in your notebook. Uh, this is something that Cambridge uh, recommend is to provide contextualized records of, of language. Include the definition and the sentence from the listening script in which the verb appears as in the example in exercise one. Okay? So not just the way the kind of the top 30 phrasal verbs is like that's not the only way of course, there are other ways but each time in context. Now, looking at a couple more exercises in a, in a similar vein, I'm just going to take a sip of water. There's a, an exercise from a course book. Again, it comes with a warning. Do not try this with your students. Um, this is not one of mine. Um, students match the, the adjective collocates with their nouns, so heavy, strong, hard, thick with, with those weather nouns below. And anyone who's ever tried something like this will know just how difficult this is. I mean, the heavy, strong, hard, thick, for example, are all very, very close. And they, they intensify the, the meaning or strength of those particular weather nouns. And, and, and 
how do I know which ones go with which and how do I check it? The dictionary is going to be the same sort of chaos as with those phrasal verbs with put. To do this is very, very difficult. So here's a, a, another s sort of solution to that um, to create a little bit of order is rather than give just one, give three. So you have the weather nouns at the top and then you can see overcast, clear, stormy sky. Now they may know clear, they may know stormy, they might not know overcast but that's easily checkable in a dictionary. Next one, fine, heavy, those are those, those kind of difficult adjectives if you like, fine and heavy, but we're given torrential there as well and that will will point to the fact that this is uh, rain and if I don't know torrential then I can look that up and there'll be much even uh, easier to find in the dictionary. And the last one here is showers, light, scattered, sh snow showers. If you look at the word scattered in the dictionary, you'll find that the second meaning, the second of two meanings is uh, uh, with, with the example there, scattered showers. And then you'll be amazed at how well students can learn these type of these adjectives. Give them two minutes just to look at that once they've done the exercise and explored the vocabulary and ask them to try and remember uh, the give them just the weather nouns and ask them to remember three adjective collocates for each one. And you can try this yourself afterwards and you'll, you'll see just how, how uh, well, easy is maybe not the word, but it's very, very doable. Um, much more support there than just hard, thick, strong, and so on. And finally, in this little section, uh, it works for word formation, creating order out of chaos, um, asking them to match up uh, suffixes uh, on the top in red with uh, the nouns below, sorry, with the words below to create nouns. Um, if we take uh, the example there, um, objection, reaction, prediction, and the last one in the group, uh, there's some kind of spelling change going on. It's the same for each of these as well. The first one, enjoy, treat, govern, argue, argument, we knock off the E, there's a spelling change there. Uh, originality, popularity, majority, ability, another spelling change for the last one. If they may not know uh, one or two of these, but they hopefully will know at least one of them. Uh, they'll know what the suffix is and that will help them with, with the other ones as well. So even though there's a lot of words there, uh, 24 here and another 24 at the bottom and another 4 there, 28 altogether, uh, they're not their existing knowledge, we're, we're calling on their existing knowledge to help them match those suffixes to the right words. Uh, we're organising that language for them. OK, I'm going to move on to transformations. This is very specific to Cambridge exams, to Cambridge First, Cambridge Advanced, uh, and so on. Uh, uh, you'll see what they are if you don't know what that is uh, a bit later. Um, here are the, the, the rules for the present perfect, the grammar rules for the present perfect. Rule one, two, three, four. I'm not going to go read them to you. You know them. Um, there are, there's and a fifth one as well. It's the first time I've done this, and so on. And that's how it's usually presented in grammar books. But in, in the, uh, sorry, grammar books or, or course books, uh, um, this is how it's tested in, in first certificate. Uh, you have present perfect and past simple there. Let me give you the answers to these. This shows you the kind of way present perfect is tested in transformations. Those of you who don't know this, students have to fill in the gaps with, with the words so that the second sentence has the same or similar meaning to the first and they have to use the word in bold there. There are only so many ways that you can test the present perfect in this way and those are, if you look at those while I'm talking and read, read through them, those are the, the classic ways that present perfect is taught, is tested in uh, transformation exercises in the first exam. Last time I spoke to, first time I've done something, uh, has been playing since, the four and since, and this last one, it's ages or it's a month or it's a long time since something happened with a past simple. Okay, now what, what I'm going to give you in the download, downloadable material, uh, are exercises like this. This is uh, for the present perfect perfect and past simple. It's a kind of, uh, once they, they, you've, you've dealt with the present perfect and past simple in your classes, before you give them that kind of transformation exercise, here's an exercise you can give them, match the sentence on the left with the two sentences on the right which have the same meaning. Uh, 
and I've put them in colour coded them so you can pick them out easily. I haven't done this before. Can be also be expressed as I've never done this or it's the first time I've done this in red. And then the blue one, I haven't done this for five years, could also be expressed by saying it's five years since I last did this. The last time I did this was five years ago. Classic transformations, the kind of thing they're going to have uh, when they when they face this in the exam, and here is an example of the downloadable material. There you have uh, present perfect and past simple. The the, the the exercise which I've just shown you there, the match up at the top, followed by the uh, transformations just below this. And again, this is the material I used with with this class I've just been doing, where I had to do a crash course for f for three months. Uh, and get them up to scratch with this kind of transformation. So we did uh, the exercise here, then they did the transformation, and they, they, they found them very difficult, but they, they could uh, go back to these sentences at the top, have a look at the structures there, and that helped them with, uh, with the transformations below. They got very good, and we, they're in the downloadable material, I have present perfect. Uh, this sheet here, you'll have comparisons, you'll have modals for, and, and other expressions for uh, obligation, permission, prohibition. There's also conditionals, and there's a final one on, on phrasal verbs, which we've already seen. Uh, and we worked our way through this, and they, they, they really helped with their confidence. Uh, created a kind of a show them what was expected for each of these grammar areas. It created a little bit of order out of that apparent chaos and help them to learn and prepare them towards that. It doesn't stop there because uh, here on the downloadable you'll have this. Now what is this? This is, on the left you have the transformations and on the right you have the answers. And what you have to do is uh, photocopy these back to back and then cut along the dotted lines that you see there. And what you end up, and I'll show you this now, is this kind of thing here, a card. Uh, these cards, uh, once you've cut them up, and you have the transformation on the front and then the answer on the other side there. Um, and as we did these, so I created sets of these card. If you have large classes, well, for these students, there weren't many, so I gave them a set each. Um, if you have larger classes, you can perhaps photocopy them back to back and get them to cut them up themselves or email, it depends what you, how you're, you're doing your classes. There's, there's, it doesn't matter if there are four or 40 students, this can still be done. They can, they can even email them the material and get them to do it at home. And for each of the uh, different areas, then there's a different color code. So we've got comparisons, we've got present perfect, we've got uh, uh, modals of obligation and so on, the areas that I just mentioned there. So a whole set of cards built up, which we use for revision activities, filler activities, um, uh, to go back over that material. Um, and that's also in the downloadables. OK. Right, uh, moving on prepositions, another area of language which uh, can be relevant to any um, exam you're training for, or just general English. Uh, how do I create order out of the chaos of prepositions? Well, certainly not like this. This is a testing exercise, like, very much like the, the phrasal verbs. This exercise, you just, you just have gut feel and you stick in the right uh, preposition, the dependent preposition afterwards. Uh, it's, it's just perpetuating the chaos. It's just a testing exercise. It's certainly not a teaching exercise and doesn't help organize the language in any way. So in the downloadables, what I've included is this, a first prepositions test. This is the test that comes at the end of your course. Now, difficult to read here, uh, but let me just talk you through it, and you can see this for yourselves later. It has three sections. The first section is, uh, what I've done is organized the prepositions. So you have here pairs, or in one case, three uh, words, where, which are related but have different prepositions. So I'll just give you a couple of examples. Uh, by accident, on purpose. By myself, on my own. Two that we often get uh, mixed up, certainly in Spain. Um, spend money on, invest money in, and so on and so forth. Or, well, there's a good one there. Be keen on, be interested in, and be fond of. Related meanings, but different prepositions. The second section is where they all have the same preposition. 
So again, reading a couple of examples, afraid, scared, frightened, this one here, uh, of, I can't read that last one, you can read that yourselves later. Um, forgive, thank, blame, apologize, tell somebody off, for. Uh, related word, words where the preposition has a similar meaning. Let's face it, forgive somebody for, why do you forgive them? For doing something. Uh, you thank somebody, why do you thank them? For doing whatever. You blame somebody, why? For whatever reason. The for has this idea of explaining the reason uh, that you're doing something. So there is a, there is a, a logic to, to the use of prepositions in many of these. Um, and then the final section, which you can have to adapt according to your country, depending on your country, words which are, these ones are prepositions uh, which are different from the Spanish equivalent. So the typical um, um, one at the end is uh, it depends on, um, in, a, in Spain a lot of people say depends of, um, get married to, a lot of people who say get married. Uh, with. So this is the end point. This is the test at the end of the year. This is not just all at once. I'm not su suggesting, um, yeah, that some, I can read some of these things as a downloadable stuff later in big fonts. Yes, don't worry, it's in bigger fonts and you can adapt it as you see fit. Let me stress, this is the end point. This is not something to go in on your first lesson and ask them to complete this. This comes at the end, uh, otherwise we would have chaos. Um, the kind of thing here, which is also in the downloadables, it is creating uh, order from that chaos. And here you have um, verbs which have dependent prepositions organized. Uh, I mentioned the thank, blame, apologize, tell off, forgive category. All those are for. And then these ones discourage and prevent from and congratulate, insist and concentrate on. So there's those, those grouped, uh, much as we did with uh, phrasal verbs before. And then they match up, match up the um, ones on the left to the, to the endings on the right. And I've given you a few examples. I'd like to thank you for sending me those flowers uh, to discourage children from swearing, find them for using bad language. And we congratulated Paul on passing all his exams. He deserved to do well. And they do the same with the others, using the context to help them match up. And again, as with the phrase of verbs, they can uh, cover up uh, the second part uh, and see if they can remember how the sentence continues. So um, I think somebody um, made a comment there, there's too much, too much. Well, yes, in that test which I just showed you. Well, yeah, well, there is too much. That, that's what they're expected to know at first. And that's not, I would stress this once again, don't give them this on the first day of your first uh, uh, course. This is the, what you're working towards. But it's important to have a syllabus uh, and, and, a, and a, an end point that you want to aim for. And in the test, it's not uh, some sort of chaotic mess of, of prepositions all over the place. I've organized them for that test at the end of the year. But you have to go through these stages like this one uh, to get to that end point. Uh, so it's little by little working towards that, that test at the end. But in those stages, as you go through, we need to be thinking, how can we organize that language? And that's what your textbook, uh, course book, should be doing for you if you can't uh, do it for yourself. Too busy, has not enough time, and that's what people like myself should be doing for you. So make sure you're not uh, being uh, given exercises which create more chaos. This is designed to create a little bit of order from that chaos. Uh, and once again, uh, this, this again, you can, uh, once you've done the pre uh, section of prepositions, here's the, the thank, the blame, the apologize, and so on. You can photocopy these back to back and create, uh, cut them up and create some, some revision cards for prepositions there as well. Again, depends on the number of students you have. Um, um, as to how you do this, but it, students love going through these cards um, and, and seeing how many they can remember. And also in this the case here, what you've got is decontextualized um, bits of language. They can try and remember the sentence uh, in, in which they first learned those prepositions. So they add the context to those uh, bits of language there. Right. Um, Time, time's going very, very fast here, but I'm, I'm reaching a point here, good, where I'm going to move away from language and into writing now. Um, 
and creating order out of chaos here. Now I'm going to show you something which you won't be able to read, but you'll be able to see what it looks like, but the actual shape of it. This is a, a writing answer to a question. Um, the writing starts here, hi Sam. Don't expect you to read that, um, but you can see from that, what, what, well you can, maybe you can't see, but what happened here was that this was a, one of the students that I was teaching I, in, in February, she hadn't had any training, they hadn't had any training in the certificate, and against my wishes they were given a, a mock exam, a practice exam. And when it came to the writing, by the time she got to there, in her own mind, she'd answered the question. The question was to to answer to to write a letter to somebody and say, uh, "I've just moved to another area. I'm I'm excited. I don't know anybody yet. What should I do to make friends at school? And how can I meet people near where I live?" Um, and she she gave her answer. By that stage, she'd given her answer. So she just said, "Don't be afraid." sure you'll make new friends, and if you live far away from your friends, meet them in the park. She had no idea about what was expected of her certificate. She hadn't been taught. So by the time she got there, she'd run out of ideas. That was a question answered. And after that, she just thought, well, I better fill up the paper. So she added lots of questions. Uh, I have some questions for you. Where do you live? Are you so far from your friends? How are you getting on with your marks? I hope fantastic and so on. Completely irrelevant, but perfectly understandable, she had no training at all on the writing. So after that, having seen that, I focused on one area, because their language is, is fairly good, it's, it's, it's B2 level, uh, there are mistakes in it, um, as we might expect at that level, but the one thing I focused on there was creating order, and that is giving it structure, and knowing what the structure should, should look like. And this same student, Madalena, her name is, uh, two weeks later produced this piece of writing. Now again, I'm not expecting you to read it, but you can see it has, after the high Patrick, there's a first paragraph, the second paragraph dealing with the first point of the question, different question this time, uh, another paragraph of similar length to the second dealing with the second point, uh, which is very common to have two points in, in, a, in a question at first, and then they're signing off at the end. And you can see just by looking at that, but this person now, Madalena, has structured her answer and create, created some order. And by creating that structure and a framework on which to put, put her language, the difference um, in the, uh, the type of answer she gave was just uh, amazing. Um, the first one would have failed completely. The second one was a very, very good answer and would have, would have got a good mark uh, for her in the, in the writing. So, just here, are, this is a slide from Ready for First to show you a couple of examples from the writing bank there. There's an article, uh, one paragraph, two paragraphs, three and four paragraphs. Very, very clear. It's the one thing that will help students to plan their answers and to do, make the best of the, most of their abilities. Um, and that looks like this. Introduction, first point, second point, conclusion for that article. And I always say to these students, four paragraphs is a good number uh, for a first, uh, for a B2 answer. It doesn't have to be four, it can be three, it can be five, as we'll see in a minute, but it's a good number to aim for. Here, in fact, is a report, an example of a report where there are, there are a group of tourists coming to your town, uh, give them advice on sightseeing, shopping, and where to have lunch. So, introduction conclusion at the end, and in the middle, sightseeing, shopping, and lunch. So that structure is like that. Introduction, first, second, third point, conclusion. Could be four, could be five paragraphs. And finally, uh, on this point, first for schools, uh, the story, this is not in the, the normal, if you like, normal first exam now, but it's in the first for schools. They still have to write a story, or could, could write a story. Um, three paragraphs, which usually follow this kind of progr progression. The background with your past perfects and your uh, past continuouses, maybe past simples. The development moving into more past simple, past continuous, and the outcome, uh, how it all ends. So there are three paragraphs, could be four, uh, as a logical number. Of, of paragraphs for that writing. So there, the key, uh, key point for creating order from chaos for writing is structure. Uh, and that would be the, the 
uh, difference was amazing. I'll come. I'll, I'll, I'll just say one more thing about reading. Uh, for those people interested in reading, there is another downloadable dealing with the gap text. Uh, those of you who teach first uh, will know that there are uh, six uh, texts with six gaps, and they have to put in uh, choose from seven sentences uh, the, the six sentences which will go and where they will go in that text. It's very difficult because students uh, it's difficult to imagine these sentences in the text. Um, they are given some help, as in as in all course books, with um, some words in bold. Those are the words to look out for for the links between the sentences and uh, the text. Um, but it does seem for training um, for as a training exercise. What I do is is this. On the left, you have the text, but in a, uh, a kind of a, a different format this time. You have bigger gaps there, um, and on the right, it's copied twice here. It's the same thing. These are the sentences. These are the missing sentences, um, and. So I just lean over. This is this is the text on card, and then these are the sentences cut up, and students can move them around uh, and see what they look like. Try try them out in the gaps, and see what they look like, and then change them if necessary. It's very easy to monitor as a teacher, um, and it makes it much more similar then to the um, drag and drop type exercise in the computer-based exam. Um, in the paper-based exam, they obviously can't do this. But in the computer one, they can take the sentences and put them in the gap and, and see if it works or not. Well, they can't do that in the paper-based, and they won't be able to do it in the exam. But in the classroom, you can do this kind of thing. And if you'd like to try this one out, by all means do that. It's in the downloadable activities, uh, along with um, for each of the readings at first, a one, two, three, four, five point uh, procedure for each of the readings. So multiple choice, gap text, multiple matching, five points uh, to follow when doing uh, those different reading tasks. Um, have a look at that uh, later when you see it in the downloadables. Um, Obviously, some of the material here is from Ready for First, but a lot of the material in the downloadables is new, unpublished material, and you're very welcome to, to use that. Um, and that's it for the moment. That's it for, for, the, for the session. If there's any questions you'd like to uh, ask me at this stage about teaching or about um, this topic, then then very happy to answer. Henry, are you there? Yes, I am, Roy. <laughs> Great <laughs> job. <laughs> okay, I, I, I'll just take the one, the first one there. I just yeah. saw a question there, which said, "Is there material for younger students as well?" Well, young, in terms of first, the, this kind of B2 level, this this is material that I've been telling you I have been using for young students for for 13, 14, well, 13, 13 year olds. They're all 13 year olds. Any younger than that, and I'm afraid I'm not an expert in, in dealing with, with younger students. Uh, that's not an area I know much about um, at all. Uh, I, I think 12, 11, 12 is the lowest I, I, I deal with. And that's fairly, fairly understandable for this kind of level. So I'm afraid I can't give you anything for lower age groups. Okay, any more questions? Um, now's your chance. Roy's going to be here for a few more minutes. The presentation I can yeah. will be downloadable. Yeah, um, I think there's another one coming in, Roy, from um, Julina. Julie, Julina or Julina? Yeah, Julina, are the yeah, exercises sorry. available in the course book? Well, some of them, yeah. The ones that are not in the downloadables are in Ready for First. Yeah, so for example, the word formation approach. Um, and uh, the weather collocations, for example, you'll find in, in Ready for First. But it really it kind of uh, is, is an example of the way my, you know, I approach writing and I approach teaching. They're both uh, ways of, certainly in these lower levels. Up to after B2, then it's a different kettle of fish and we need another session. But in these lower levels, students need their confidence built up. Um, and that this idea of creating chaos Sorry, chaos. No, creating order from chaos is, is is applicable to those kind of levels. So yeah, if it's not on the downloadables, it, it'll be in ready uh, for stuff that I've used. Thank you. Um, time for a couple more. 
before Roy has to go. Oh, there's quite a long one from Fernando yeah. that's come in there. Can you I've got some other students who don't have a lot of time for study. Which do you think are the points to be prioritised? Any particular areas or grammar point? Right, okay. Uh, yeah, that's, well, that's exactly what I've been talking about. Really, that's, uh, that's a good question because, because it's a reiterate what I've been saying. Uh, these people don't have, the people I've been teaching, whether they're 13 or 23, I could use the same material. Uh, these are people who haven't had a lot of time. Um, they've got the school children, so they've got lots of uh, other other homework to do as well. So what I've tried to show is the areas, the key areas that I would focus on. In terms of language, give them the top 30 phrasal verbs. Um, in terms of transformations, do that, the transformations exercises that I've given you for downloading. In terms of the prepositions, look at the preposition test. Maybe not do all of them, but select from those areas. Uh, and if you look at uh, my books, for example, you'll find ex some exercises which deal with those. And if not, maybe you can create your own for different areas of prepositions. So which are the points to be prioritized? Well, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a big question. But I've focused on areas that I thought I could give my students confidences in when they went into the exam. So those are the areas I looked at. Other people might have a different answer to that, which is fine, uh, but I had three months, and that's those the areas that I looked at. Okay, and there's um, another one that's just come in about where to find listing materials for the CAE exam. Is that something? Well, there's more, I think there's more uh, yeah. on the Macmillan website. You'll find lots yeah. of listening material in the uh, Ready for Advanced uh, book. We've got uh, listenings in the, I have to say that, don't I? Uh, we have listenings in the workbook there. We have a lot of extra listening material. Because uh, because we know people want that, so we've given a lot of listening. The same with the Ready for First, lots of extra listening material uh, in Ready for First in the workbook as well. Um, but as far as looking for, for supplementary books, I'm afraid, I should, maybe I should know, but uh, perhaps if you look on the Macmillan website, you'll find, uh, and, and, and get into their catalogue, you'll find, I think there are skills books which, which have been written with more, um, more work on the listening. But there's plenty in, plenty in those two books that are up on the screen at the moment. Excellent. Um, thanks ever so much, Roy, for being Pleasure. with us today. I think... Um, We've kept you long enough now, and um, there's lots yeah, of nice thank comments you very much. coming nice in as well. So been it's been useful. Like enjoyed people. the thank session. So much. That's great. <laughs> and so that's perfect timing because it's about quarter to here. Um, if you want to just say a quick few words to everyone, then yeah. Well, well thanks for all for tuning in, everybody, free. and especially well everyone. But uh, it was nice to see people from all these places that I haven't been to before. Uh, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, and Serbia, and many other places. Canaries, even. And um, somebody's just recommended a listening book there. Hang on. And that's, uh, can you read that? Well, maybe. Uh, there's, a, there's a book called Listening and Speaking for Advanced by Macmillan. Very recommendable. Thank you. Uh, uh, sorry, yeah. no, thank you for that. Okay, uh, yes, thank you everyone, and I'll leave you now. And uh, it stopped raining, so I can. Let me out. Right. Uh, <laughs> goodbye. Thanks for listening in. Where do I turn off? Okay. Yeah. Thanks again, Roy. See you soon. <laughs> Cheers. Okay. Um, so, uh, just to wrap things up, I want to remind you that uh, the recording, which I'm about to stop,